Hi, and welcome to another video in fluid mechanics. Up to this point, in all of these fluid mechanics videos, we have made a critical assumption. Flow has been incompressible. This means that the density is assumed constant throughout the entire fluid domain. It's a pretty common assumption and applies to most slow-moving gases and pretty much all liquids. We derive the conservation equations assuming incompressibility and use these incompressible equations to analyze enclosed flows like pipes and external flows like boundary layers. In the simplest example, if you have a flow entering a volume and the fluid is incompressible, then the same amount of fluid needs to exit that volume at the same rate. This is the conservation of mass, in equals out. But what happens if flow becomes compressible? Maybe we have a gas and are moving pretty quickly. Now, Density is not a constant and can vary within our domain. If we consider that simple example again of flow entering and leaving our volume, now the mass inside that volume is allowed to change. We can no longer say absolutely that in must equal out. Now, the difference between in and out represents the rate of change of our mass. This is still conservation of mass, but in compressible form. Today, we take a brief and broad introduction to compressible flows. In this series, it only gets a single video, but that's because we go into way more depth on it in aerodynamics, where compressible flows are much more common. And with that, let's jump in. Today is all about compressible flows. It's common to think of compression as taking a volume of something and squeezing on it until it takes up less volume, or vice versa. However, in the context of fluids, we still tend to think in terms of fixed control volumes, so it's more accurate to think of stuffing more fluid into the same fixed amount of space. By definition, compressible flow is when the density of the fluid is not a constant. It varies in different areas of your flow field. One of the main criteria for having a compressible flow is that you have a gas. Due to the molecular structure of liquids, it just takes an obscene amount of force to get them to be any closer together. Realistically, liquids are fully incompressible. Gases, however, can be compressed. Even with the strength of your own hand, you can squeeze an empty soda bottle to compress the air inside. In a flow where you aren't directly squeezing the gas, the compressibility tends to happen at higher speed. We'll see why this is the case in a minute. Compressible flows are typically in aerodynamics because aerodynamics is the study of air and air is the most common gas that we deal with. It's common to see compressible flow over a commercial aircraft. Their cruise velocity is certainly high enough that the density varies over the entire craft. We see them in space vehicles. As you leave the atmosphere, the density gets smaller and smaller and it gets easier for flow to become compressible. Also, by design, Flows are compressible in high-speed aircraft and ballistics, where things like shock waves are common. All of these types of flows require the use of compressible fluid mechanics to better predict and understand how the vehicles would perform. Your first question likely is, how do I know if my flow is compressible? We can't immediately see density gradients, so what's the criteria to tell? Typically, we use the flow Mach number to tell us if flow is incompressible. You might remember the Mach number from the non-dimensional numbers video. It is the dimensionless ratio of the flow inertia compared to the compressive forces. If we think of it as a block and spring system, the inertia of the fluid is analogous to how hard the block pushes on the spring. And, just like a gas, the spring requires force to compress. If the block doesn't have enough force behind it, then the spring won't compress. This represents a low Mach number situation, low inertia to compressive forces. The inertia of the flow needs to be high enough to compress the fluid, otherwise it is relatively incompressible. I can't fully derive it here, but this works out to be the following ratio. Inertia is rho times L squared, a length scale, times u squared, a velocity scale. The compressive forces look very similar, but instead of the velocity squared, it's the speed of sound, 
The speed of sound, after a lot of background derivation, is a representation of the change in pressure compared to the change in density. In a way, it's how much the fluid pushes back when you compress it. So, the Mach number is quite simply the ratio of the flow velocity to the speed of sound. And since generally speed of sound is constant, the Mach number really is a non-dimensional way to represent the speed of the flow. And now we know this speed tells us if generally the flow is compressible. But let's think of it from a different angle. I like to think of compressible flow as energetic gas dynamics or energetic aerodynamics. In short, it's when the flow has enough kinetic energy that it starts to become meaningful relative to the internal energy. Let's see an example. Consider a vat of air that weighs one kilogram. Inside, we have a ton of air molecules. As a whole, this vat of air is still, so there's no bulk velocity. However, if you zoomed in on the air molecules, you would notice that they like to bounce around a bit. If you took a statistical average of the amount of energy in the molecules bouncing around, you would get the gas internal energy, E. For this case, the internal energy is 2.07 times 10 to the fifth joules. This is quite a bit of energy. Now, let's take our vat of fluid and move it at some velocity, where we're going to add bulk motion. We give it a velocity, U. Now we have a mass of fluid and a bulk velocity, we can consider the flow's kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is one-half mass times velocity squared. Now let's say we're going just a measly 30 meters per second. The kinetic energy of our fluid would be 4.5 times 10 to the 2 joules. Pretty small. This is three orders of magnitude smaller than the internal energy. However, if the flow were going roughly twice the speed of sound, 686 meters per second, we would get a kinetic energy on the same order as the internal energy. These two energies are quite comparable now, and the bulk flow movement has energetic meaning. And there's an important relationship between the kinetic and internal energy. If you were to, all of a sudden, slow down this one kilogram of air, the kinetic energy would need to go somewhere, and it would go into the internal energy. If you're going slow, this isn't a big deal. But if you go fast enough, that can significantly change the internal energy of the flow, changing things like fluid temperature. Now let's circle back to the Mach number. Plot the kinetic energy on the y-axis. Here, we can also draw a line that represents the fluid internal energy, E. On the x-axis, we have the flow speed, represented by the Mach number. As Mach number increases, the kinetic energy increases exponentially, eventually passing the internal energy. The aerodynamics community generally agrees that the Mach number of 0.3 is an important boundary. It represents when the kinetic energy is roughly 2.5% of the internal energy. It also represents when density changes are around 5%, but we don't have time to get into that here. It's a relatively arbitrary, but widely agreed upon boundary of Mach number. So, generally speaking, we consider flow to be compressible above a Mach number of 0.3. A common point of confusion is assuming compressible flow means Mach 1. Mach 1 just means that you're moving as fast as the speed of sound. This is sonic flow. But flow is compressible much slower than that. Let's consider a scale of Mach number from 0 to 10. Incompressible flows make up everything between Mach 0 to 0 0.3. Everything between that and Mach 1 is compressible, but subsonic, meaning slower than the speed of sound. Around Mach 1 is a region called transonic, and when you're cr clearly above Mach 1, flow is supersonic, meaning faster than the speed of sound. Supersonic flows represent everything between Mach 1 and Mach 5. Here, thermodynamics is an issue that we need to keep track of. There is flow heating, shock waves, etc. But chemistry, for the most part, behaves. Above Mach 5, however, we have another regime called hypersonic. Hypersonic flows are super difficult. 
At these kinetic energies, the molecular structure of the gas starts to change entirely. You have so much kinetic energy that it, when it starts to go into the internal energy, molecules start to split apart and dissociate and become ionic. Here, chemistry really becomes a necessity to keep track of. So it's important to keep in mind what regime of compressible flow you're in, especially at really high speeds or high altitudes. With the added complexity of compressible flow, we find the theoretical analysis of these flows to be also a little bit more difficult. Let's consider the conservation of equations, but we won't say the flow is incompressible anymore, as we have in the past. First, we have the conservation of mass. You might remember from our original derivation of this equation, it starts with the simple claim that if the mass in is not equal to the mass out, we must have a change in mass in our system. In equation form for a fluid, this becomes the following. Note here, the density rho stays inside the derivative. We can't assume it's constant anymore, so it has to stay in there. And, unlike for incompressible flow, the right-hand side is no longer zero. It's the time rate of change of the density. Physically, this is the balance of the change in momentum in the three directions, x, y, and z. And on the right, we have the, how much the fluid weighs, in a sense. If more goes in than leaves, things get heavier or more dense. Simple enough. Now, on to the conservation of momentum. If you recall, this is Newton's second law that the rate of change of momentum of a particle must be due to force. Notice again, we can't use the F equals MA version. We need the version that keeps the mass inside the derivative because it could be changing. In equation form for a fluid, we see some familiar terms and some new terms. Let's take a second and write it out completely. I have circled the new stuff, two terms that have a triple set of spatial derivatives inside. This combination of derivatives represents a compression or expansion and is necessarily zero for an incompressible fluid because of conservation of mass. But now things are compressible, so these terms stick around. Physically speaking, we have the traditional and convective acceleration term from our material derivative. This is how things accelerate through space and time. The first new term represents the rate at which momentum leaves or enters our volume due to expansion or compression. When things squeeze in, they bring their own momentum with them, and that needs to be accounted for. On the right-hand side, we have our external forcing. First, pressure force is the force due to a pressure difference. There's also traditional viscous forcing, the forces that come from our air particles bouncing from one streamline to another, bringing with them a change in momentum. Next up, we have another new term, and this one is a viscosity term. As flow compresses in or expands out, the relative velocity between two points might change. This is the hardest one to draw effectively, but think of an expanding balloon. The particle in the center stays put, u1, while the particle towards the outside grows faster and faster. This is a velocity gradient because u2 of the particle near the outside of the balloon is different than u1, and therefore there is viscous forcing due to this velocity gradient. Lastly, if you have it, there is also a body force. Things like gravity, Coriolis and electromagnetic forces are included here. Please keep in mind that this equation really represents three equations, one for each direction. The variables marked in white can change and are either x and u, y and v, or z and w. And these three equations make up the conservation of momentum. Traditionally, these four equations effectively let you solve for the four unknowns, u, v, w, and p for pressure. However, we now have an additional unknown, the flow density, and we need another equation to solve for it. To get this, we use the conservation of energy, 
This law states that the sum of the heat and the work done to a system must be equal to the change in energy of that system. This is the first law of thermodynamics. And as you'll see with compressible flows, we'll often need thermodynamics to help close and solve for our system. In equation form for a fluid, we get the following expression for the conservation of energy. Let's take a second and write it all out. As I write it, I'm going to label the terms with numbers so we can discuss each term physically below. Generally speaking, this is quite similar physically to the momentum equation, but now we consider energy instead. The first term is the material derivative, which means we're looking at the traditional and convective acceleration of a quantity. And the quantity we're looking at represent is the rate of change of the internal energy E, and the kinetic energy, which goes as u squared. Note here u is in vector form. In the second term, we have the compressibility specific term. This is the rate that energy, either internal or kinetic, leaves and enters the system through expansion or compression. The right hand side represents the work done and heat added due to the external forces. Term 3 quite simply is the heat into or out of our system. Maybe there's an external heating source nearby. The fourth term is the work done by the pressure force. Remember, the work is the force times the velocity, which is why we see pressure times velocity inside the derivatives. Similarly, we have work done by the body forces in term 5. Lastly, we bundle all the viscous terms into 6 and 7. Here, we have the work done due to the viscosity force, and also the heat added due to viscosity. Viscosity allows kinetic energy to dissipate into heat, which is why it gets a special heating term, unlike the pressure and body forces. And, this long equation is the conservation of energy. It's an additional set of rules our flow needs to follow. Unfortunately, it likely made our life more complicated. Luckily, we can still use common assumptions that are applied to compressible flows. In compressible aerodynamics, it's still common to see steady, inviscid, and no body force assumptions. Also, because we have thermodynamics, we can use thermodynamic assumptions like using a perfect gas, whether it's adiabatic, and isentropic and these additional assumptions can apply to the above equations. With our fifth total equation, the conservation of energy, we inadvertently added two more unknowns into our system, so we're not done yet. We need to use thermodynamics throughout compressible flow analysis to solve for two more unknowns, the flow internal energy, E, and the temperature, T. For this, we can briefly highlight a few equations that make up tools in our thermodynamics toolbox. First, you have the equation of state that helps you get the flow temperature. P equals rho RT, the relationship between pressure, density, and temperature for a perfect gas. Next, there are the assumed forms of the function for internal energy and enthalpy. Here, you assume that internal energy and specific enthalpy scale linearly with the fluid temperature, T, via the constants of specific heat. Lastly, one of the most common equations you'll see in compressible flow analysis is the second law of thermodynamics applied to an isentropic system. This relates ratios of pressure, density, and temperature between any two points in a fluid. These are super important to the analysis of shock waves and analyzing what happens upstream and downstream of a shock. Shock waves are a critical aspect of compressible flows. Let's consider all the common characteristics of compressibility. First and foremost, the ever popular shock wave is a direct result of flow being compressible and sonic or supersonic. A shock wave is a cone or a wall region that appears on vehicles moving faster than the speed of sound. 
It happens when you travel faster than a disturbance because pressure waves in a gas move at the speed of sound. To best understand why shock waves occur, I actually like to use throwing a rock into water as an analogy. Pretend you're standing next to a slow-moving river and you toss in a rock. You'll notice that when the rock hits the water, it sends ripples outward from the center in a series of wave propagations. These are disturbance waves, and your rock was the disturbance source. This is the same in gas, although not as visible. When you cause a disturbance, maybe the leading edge of a wedge in the slow-moving flow, the waves propagate away from the source at the speed of sound. After all, sound itself is a propagation of disturbance waves. Now let's turn the velocity up a bit and go back to our river. The river speed now exceeds the wave propagation speed. We toss in our rock and notice the waves are swiftly carried downstream by the river and never actually go upstream of the rock. If you connected the edges of each wave in series, you would get an angled wall or barrier where upstream of it there are no disturbances. In air, if you move fast enough, you can also outrun your disturbances when the velocity is faster than the speed of sound. It looks very much in the same way. The disturbances are all carried downstream and you get a wall or barrier where upstream there is no disturbance. In a gas, this is called a shock wave. And apart from looking really cool, it also has some interesting features. If we zoom in on the shock, we'll see that upstream flow is untouched and above Mach 1. However, across the shock there is a dramatic change in the flow velocity, becoming subsonic. As we learned above, this loss in kinetic energy has to go somewhere and we see a spike in the fluid pressure, density, and temperature. All these impact the dynamics and forces of the flow. Although we've only drawn a single type of shock here, there are a number of different types of flows depending on surface angle characteristics. In supersonic flow, anytime the surface changes angle, you get a shock. In a converging-diverging nozzle, you find sh normal shocks, shocks that are normal to the flow. These are the easiest to analyze and understand and represent the foundation of our shock theory. On surfaces like a wedge with a sharp leading edge, you get the angled oblique shock. Past these shocks, you not only get a jump in fluid properties, but also a change in flow direction. If the leading edge is curved or the surface angle is too shallow, you find detached shocks or bow shocks that are upstream of the surface itself floating and they're rounded. Lastly, as the flow expands or opens, you get something called the expansion fan, a relatively unique form of shock where the changes are more gradual. All these types of shocks have been analyzed and derived in much greater detail in other aerodynamics focused videos on this channel. Outside of the shock itself, there are other notable characteristics. First, you can get extremely high temperatures in compressible flows. As we discussed earlier, the friction at the surface and the slowing of the flow results in the loss of kinetic energy, meaning the internal energy can increase. As a result, we see high temperature spikes on the surface in compressible flows. Additionally, we also get new forms of aerodynamic drag that we don't have for incompressible flow. Shock wave drag occurs due to the pressure difference caused by shock asymmetry, which adds drag to the body that is different than the other pressure drags we're used to. Shocks, added drag, and added temperature are the three main characteristics of shock waves. In practice, you might come across compressibility in fluid mechanics in general, but it's very important to fields like aerodynamics. You will notice it influences vehicle design. We move away from the conventional airfoils and get designs with much sharper edges and corners, which give you controlled and predictable shock formations. It greatly influences your material choices. We've literally had to invent materials that can withstand the heat of re-entry vehicles due to compressibility and heating. Lastly, it adds new forces to our vehicle that need to be accounted for in order to properly fly and control the aircraft.
Also, once you start dealing with shock waves, deriving the equations directly is a bit less common. You'll find it's much more common to continuously use lookup tables to get fluid and shock properties for a known flow situation. And that's it for our brief overview of compressible flow. Let's review. Compressible flows are flows where density is no longer constant, common in commercial aircraft, high-speed aircraft, and spacecraft. The flow speed and Mach number are what tell you if flow is compressible and is when the kinetic energy of the fluid becomes meaningful compared to the internal energy. We reviewed the compressible conservation equations including the conservation of the mass, the conservation of momentum, and a new conservation of energy. With these added equations, we also need to bring with us a thermodynamics toolbox of gas-specific equations that help us get internal energy and fluid temperature, two additional unknowns. We learn that shock waves are an important feature of the compressible supersonic flow, where flow properties jump dramatically across the shock. And in practice, compressible flows influence vehicle design, material choice, and vehicle dynamics. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.